Good morning, everybody. Welcome to 2016 pre-wet season construction site inspection training. I'm Matt Tucker. I was responsible for inviting you to this training. Uh, we have you for about two hours. In those two hours, we're going to essentially show you how to and why to uh, keep either you know, your contractors in compliance with uh, construction site regulations and your own job sites in compliance with construction site regulations. Uh, we have representatives from a, uh, a city perspective, uh, a county perspective, and uh, Mr. Daniel App from Aluna is here uh, presenting uh, the regulatory framework and also giving an overview on erosion controls and sediment controls. Uh, let's see what else. Uh, this session is videotaped, and uh, a videotape reproduction will be available of this session at some point. So in the future, um, I'll either get that out to you or you can contact me and that will be available. Also, all materials are, ava are available through me, and you should have my email or my phone number. I think that is it. You have some good resources in the room today. Again, it's Daniel Apt, uh, Jim Ridd from the city of Huntington Beach, and Robin Lamont, OC Parks. And I think with that, we will start the training. Thank you for coming. Enjoy it. Thank you, Matt. Good morning. How's everybody doing today? All right, well, we'll dive right in. So what we're going to go through today, um, I'm going to go through the CGP and the MS4 uh, permit requirements, and I'll get into the details of erosion and sediment control. Um, then we'll get uh, Robin Lamont from uh, County Parks. She's going to give her perspective. Um, and then Jim Marid uh, with the city of Huntington Beach, he's going to give the city perspective. Then I'm going to do a short presentation on an enforcement case study um, that was an ACL against the county. So with that, we'll go ahead and get started. So this training is part of a comprehensive uh, training program that the Orange County Stormwater Program has put together. Uh, that program was first put together in 2008, and we've recently updated it last year, and it includes core competencies for a variety of different uh, training uh, elements uh, across the different program elements, including the knowledge, skills, and level of experience that we're looking to impart on you as part of this training. There are also uh, certificates of completion and proficiency, and you'll be getting those um, emailed to you. So make sure that you have signed in so you do get one of those. So this is one of several uh, mo training modules that we've put together. Uh, this is also a requirement to be done prior to the wet season each year. We decided to move up the training this year a little bit to the beginning of September, give you an opportunity to absorb that information before uh, the wet season actually hits. So I'm going to go through the CGP and the <clears throat> Municipal Separate Storm Sewer System Permit Requirements. So for the, for the CGP, uh, that permit took effect on July 1st, 2010. Um, it does cover sites that are greater than one acre. Uh, it is a risk-based permit, and that risk is based on sediment and receiving water risk. It does have specific training requirements, which I'll go into in just a moment. And then the permit was amended in 2012 to remove the New York effluent limits and receiving water monitoring. The State Water Board is currently working on an update to this permit, um, and I've been privy to some of the, um, some of the information that's going to be included in that update. Generally, it'll have the same kind of format, um, so no major changes uh, going forward. So I mentioned the risk categories. So when a site is uh, going through and developing our, their notice of intent and they're doing their risk uh, analysis, they're looking at um, both the receiving water risk as well as the sediment risk for that particular site. And the combination of those two will either identify that that site is a risk level one, two, or three. The requirements for a risk level one site include general housekeeping and the minimum BMPs. Inspections do have to be performed by a qualified SWIP practitioner, and those inspections do have to be formally documented. And inspections go across, there's uh, a weekly inspection that has to be done. There are um, inspections that also have to be done prior to, during, and after storm events. And then there's also a quarterly non-stormwater inspection. There are no rain event action plans that are required for the risk level one sites, and there's no numeric action levels as well. For risk levels two and three, all of the risk level one requirements have to be implemented. There are all rain event action plans that are required. They have to be um, implement or developed 48 hours prior to the rain event and implemented on site 24 hours prior to that rain event. And they have to be specifically developed for that phase of construction that that construction project is under. 
There is uh, monitoring requirements. Um, there's three samples that have to be taken per day, and those samples are for pH and uh, turbidity. And there's an analysis for the numeric action levels that has to be done uh, to see if there is an exceedance for those numeric action levels for both pH and tur turbidity. And if there is an exceedance, those exceedances have to be reported to the state board within 10 days for the risk level two projects and within five days for the risk level three projects. And of course, that site then has to go out and fix the BMP issues, potentially add more BMPs to ensure that they're no longer uh, in violation and future samples are in compliance. So there is a uh, specific training that was developed as part of the construction general permit. I helped to develop that training um, as part of uh, the CASCA team. Um, there is a three-day training for the qualified SWIP developers and a two-day training for the qualified SWIP practitioners. Um, we are actually providing a class um, on behalf of the Orange County Stormwater Program that will be happening um, starting in Mission Viejo on the 21st, uh, the 20th and 21st of this month. So if you're interested in taking that class, please contact Matt Tucker. He'll get you all the detailed information. And then the third day for the QSDs, we have yet to set a date. Um, but if you're interested in taking that training, please contact Matt. Any more information that you're interested in on the construction general permit, you can go to the uh, State Water Board website, uh, which is identified here. So now I'm going to get into the detailed requirements for the Santa Ana region uh, MS4 permit, specifically related to inspection of construction sites. So um, the requirements under this particular permit talks about um, consistency with the model construction program, uh, maintaining an updated inventory of all the different construction sites that have building and grading permits within your jurisdiction. So that's part of the responsibility of the municipality. There also is a requirement to prioritize inspection of those sites as high, medium, or low threat, and that's based on the threat to, to the receiving water quality. Um, and then also, you do have uh, limitations to those inspections, and that's essentially limitations with um, laws of both uh, California and the United States, the specific ordinances of your particular jurisdiction, the model, run its, uh, model construction program, and the Orange County Construction Runoff Guidance Manual. There is uh, a checklist for inspectors that has to include verifying if that site is greater than one acre coverage under the construction general permit. Um, documentation of review of the uh, erosion and sediment control plan or the stormwater pollution prevention plan. Um, and then you're also looking for visual observations of non-stormwater discharges and the potential for pollutant discharges on that site. Um, there's also a requirement to term compliance with um, local uh, grading and water quality ordinances permits uh, if, they're, if the site triggers a WQMP and so forth. And then most importantly, you're actually looking at the site, you're assessing the effectiveness of the MP, BMPs that have been implemented at that particular site. So the permit also identifies specific inspection frequencies. Uh, the dry season, May 1st to September 30th, you're looking at uh, frequency to essentially control that sediment and other pollutants from being discharged on the site. In the wet season, October 1st to April 30th, for those designations, high priority sites, you're actually going out once per month medium twice per wet season and low priority sites once during that wet season period. Um, there's also a requirement, and this is actually something that the county is looking at fairly closely on enforcement. There has to be consistent enforcement for those non-compliant sites. We heard a presentation yesterday from the San Diego Regional Board that it's the responsibility of the municipal agencies to ensure that there is an escalating enforcement policy. This is the same in the Santa Ana Board and it's your responsibility to ensure that if you see violations on the site, that you are implementing that escalation enforcement policy. And the reason why it's so important is because if you don't take those actions, then you could be culpable in an ACL that is uh, issued to that particular construction site for not uh, implementing the requirements of the MS4 permit. So very important uh, distinction uh, to be made uh, that uh, you need to make sure that you are documenting and, and documenting violations and um, escalating that enforcement going forward. Um, and there's a variety of different enforcement elements. Uh, there's an enforcement consistency guide that can be referenced to identify essentially what are those different enforcement actions that can be taken 
um, written enforcement, other actions is appropriate. Um, and then you're also required to, no to notify the uh, of violations to the regional board. Essentially, if there's an imminent threat to uh, human health or the environment within 24, uh, 24 hours, then you have five days um, to just uh, notify other regular violations. There's a requirement to also respond to third party complaints if you get called. Yeah, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, the question essentially was, are we going to go through the San Diego uh, requirements? We're not going to go through those today, but we do have those in another training presentation that will be av made available. Yes, different frequencies, yes. Um, so there is this requirement to respond to third-party complaints in a timely manner. So if you get calls um, talking about sediment discharges um, within a neighborhood mm -hmm. and so forth, you have to make sure that you are responding to those too. There's training of inspectors. That's part of what we're doing here today is to get you all trained before the wet season starts. Any questions about the MS4 permit requirements before I go on to the inspections um, and erosion and sediment control basics? Okay. So what to inspect? Um, when you're out inspecting a, a construction site, you're really looking at um, those areas that haven't achieve final stabilization. Those areas that um, have, it, have already achieved that final stabilization, you don't need to inspect. How do you know this? Well, basically, the first thing that you're going to be doing when you go to a construction site is you're going to talk to the site operator, you're going to get a copy of their stormwater pollution prevention plan or their erosion and sediment control plan. That will be your guide to your inspection. That, along with your inspection forms, will really help you identify what are the specific BMPs that are identified on site, what are the type of pollutants um, that you can expect based on the type of activities that are going on in that site? And that will help you, that will guide you as you're moving through your inspection. The other thing that's really important to take a look at is taking a look at um, the inspection records on site. If those inspection records are up to date, chances are you're going to see good implementation of BMPs on that particular site. If they're not kept up to date, well, the chances of those BMPs being kept up to date are probably pretty minimal as well. So first stop, check in, take a look at the SWIP and review that or the erosion and sediment control plan and that will give you a good idea on how to do your inspections. You're also inspecting um, all your erosion and sediment control bees, BMPs. You're looking um, for evidence of potential soil and other pollutants discharging on the site. And again, you're looking at all these potential pollutants that, um, that are identified and those should really be specific to the type of construction that's going on. So the purpose of the inspection is you're trying to identify if the BMPs that have been identified in either the SWIP or the Erosion and Sediment Control Plan have been implemented correctly. You're looking to identify if there are failures and then providing those recommendations on um, how those failures can be corrected. So how to start an inspection. Once you've gone through the SWIP, you have an idea on the SWIP map where all the different BMPs are located. You then start from the uh, most downstream part of that particular construction site. You're looking at the specific discharge points. And then you're going upstream. That ha allows you the ability to inspect the BMPs and see the effect of those BMPs from the downstream end. Are they having the intended effect uh, going up? Um, and then you're noting any evidence of that potential for pollution to, uh, to leave the site. And very important to make sure that you're taking adequate di digital photographs. That way you can um, have that as part of your record. It also helps with your reinspection to see uh, a comparison of what the BMP failure is and how it was uh, uh, corrected moving forward. So some of the key areas that you were looking at um, when you're inspecting, obviously all disturbed areas. You're looking at your site perimeter uh, controls, any conveyances that are on site. Um, if there is a receiving water that is on site as well, you're looking at the edge of that receiving water. Obviously, making sure all drain inlets um, and catch basins are protected, um, and then obviously looking at the discharge points from that particular construction site. You also want to make sure you're looking at the storage and staging areas. Um, the staging areas sometimes are not necessarily identified as part of the, uh, in the SWIP plan. They should be, making sure that those are being maintained as well. You're looking at um, all your stockpiles to see if they have appropriate controls, your sanitary facilities, um, solid waste storage, uh, making sure that they're effectively covered, 
any equipment fueling areas, um, and then of course your concrete washouts, which we see a lot of problems with continually. So I'm going to go through erosion and sediment control BMPs and essentially how they work. One thing to note, there is the Orange County Construction Runoff Guidance Manual that was updated just a couple years ago. Um, it is, provides very useful, succinct information, both as an inspector and as a site operator that can really be beneficial. Um, it's very easy to carry with you out in the field so you understand what you're looking at. Um, and it provides a reference that you can provide to those construction sites of how they should be implementing BMPs. Um, it does also have provide an overview of the different requirements that already went through. Um, and if you don't have a copy, uh, you can get an electronic copy at this link here or talk to Matt Tucker and there's still plenty of copies available at the county. So I'm going to go through uh, all the different types of BMPs now and give just a general description of what you're looking at. So the first line of defense is really erosion control BMPs. And erosion control BMPs are designed to keep that soil in place on site, prevent that erosion um, from happening from that soil in its natural condition. Um, we see a lot of different construction sites that have really ignored the use of erosion control BMPs. Um, and a lot of construction sites kind of play with the, well, it's an active area, so I shouldn't uh, put down erosion control BMPs. And they say, well, it's been active in the last week or, you know, the last two weeks. For the construction permit, it has to be active within a two-week period. Otherwise, there should be erosion controls that are laid down. So the first one is really uh, the simplest of erosion control BMPs. This is a soil binder. This is usually applied for temporary applications. So if that particular part of the site is going to be disturbed at a later point in time, this is good for um, just you know, a few months of coverage. It does have to be environmentally benign, and it shouldn't really stain uh, uh, paved or painted surfaces. Good examples are polyacrylamides, uh, guar, starch, and then there's also a variety of different propriety, proprietary measures as well. The next one is hydrologic mulch. Um, the thing with uh, hydrologic mulch, it does need 24 hours prior to a rain vent uh, to essentially um, be functional. Um, and there's really uh, a variety of different ones that, that work really well. The best ones I've seen are uh, a binder with a wood fiber combination and a die so that you understand, the app applicator understands where it's been applied, um, as well as the inspector can see that. Landscaping mulch is very good for uh, final stabilization, either for slopes or even on sites where construction will continue, but um, there's, there's a desire to essentially close out that site for, com for coverage under the CGP. The, um, that's a good example in the one in the left, lower left-hand corner. It's a flat site, and there's a lot of still open sediment, but they needed essentially final, final stabilization before construction continues in a couple years. Bonded fiber matrix is uh, a little bit more expensive product, and the idea here is that it can last for um, several wet seasons. So this is for those type of construction sites where you're not looking for that final stabilization of um, you know, your vegetation, but you do want to maintain and make sure that there's no um, erosion issues on the site. So it's a combination of a polyacrylamide and a different fiber product like a wood or a paper-based mulch, and that can be applied, and it does last for several seasons. We also see the use of straw mulch. Um, the re this has really been um, used on a less frequent basis in California because there is a potential fire hazard with implementing it, but it can work really well as long as it's combined with a tackifier um, and it is uh, crimped into the soil. Um, usually these last, last for about one wet season, but they do, it does provide really excellent performance. Then we have kind of the higher end uh, version of uh, erosion controls, which is the geotextiles and mats. Um, these are somewhat easier to apply, essentially just rolled out. The key with applying these is that those geotextiles and mats have intimate contact with the soil. They have to be staked in properly. Otherwise, you get a rilling effect underneath those particular mats, and you get erosion going on um, underneath them. Hydro seeding um, is also a good option. Uh, this takes a little bit more time for stabilization, so it's usually good to actually mix hydro uh, or seeds into uh, an application with like polyacrylamide, so you get the soil stabilization, but then you get the long-term benefits of the vegetation growth. You can see here, um, one of the pictures here in the, in the bottom left-hand corner, 
Uh, part of the slope's been hydro seeded and the other part hasn't. You can see the significant amount of rilling that happens in, in just that, that bare slope with that, without that vegetative support. Now I'm going to get into the sediment control BMPs. Remember, for construction sites, you need an effective combination of both erosion and sediment controls. Erosion controls being your first line of defense to keep soil in its natural place on the site where it's supposed to be, and sediment controls really preventing that sediment from discharging off-site. So there's a variety of different sediment controls I'll go through. Probably the most common one is a silt fence, um, and these are really good for perimeter controls or locating on the level contours of slopes, not in a perpendicular fashion, and they're not good for concentrated flows. They don't have the capacity to be able to stop that water and filter out those pollutants. The key thing with the uh, uh, silt fences is they do have to be keyed into the soil. You see a lot of silt fence applications where there's just a couple inches or an inch of space underneath it. They have no effect whatsoever, so they really do need to be keyed into the soil. The next one is the sediment basin. Um, so the idea here is that sediment basins work really well if they're implemented in combination with erosion control BMPs. Otherwise, those sediment basins, the capacity fills up very quickly. These are for larger tributary areas. They will always have to have a spillway implemented in them, and they really have to drain within, uh, within essentially a week. Um, there's a comprehensive fact sheet in both the uh, Orange County Construction Runoff Guidance Manual and the CASCA Manual that gets into the details of the detailed design of this and their specific requirements associated with the general construction permit. Fiber rolls, um, these can serve as both a perimeter control and they also serve as how to segment slopes to essentially slow down that velocity of stormwater runoff coming off of those slopes. Their good spacing is between 30 and 60 feet on slopes. More intense slopes, you might even uh, build that up to about 20 feet uh, spacing. Gravel bag berms, again, can be used as perimeter controls. These are really good in concentrated flow areas, implementing chevrons or check dams. They have the capacity and the weight to be able to, to, to handle and, and hold that, back, that water back. And remember, we do call them gravel bags nowadays. They're not sandbags. We stopped using sandbags a while ago because they eventually split their guts and then guess what? You've got discharge of sediment. So gravel bags are what we use nowadays. So throughout the presentation, I'm going to talk about uh, some of the smaller urban sites um, and, and give some context. This, this was a request a couple of years ago to make sure that we're not just looking at the larger construction sites, we're looking at the smaller ones as well. So as far as the context of perimeter controls for the smaller sites, all three of the different ones that I talked about, the fiber rolls, the gravel bags, as well as the um, silt fences can work, um, but understanding the conditions of that particular site and you know, what's happening there can help to really identify what's the appropriate BMP for that particular site. Inlet protection. So uh, we continue to see issues with the implementation of inlet protection on different sites. Um, the fundamental property associated with inlet protection is it is a detention-based uh, control measure in that you put your gravel bags in front of your inlet controls or around your inlet controls. The sediment-laden water ponds up against that. The sediment falls out and cleaner water overtops the gravel bags and into uh, that drain inlet. There is a difference with implementation both in the wet season and in the dry season. Um, in the dry season, you're going to use that filter fabric to essentially keep the dust out of the storm drain system. Um, that filter fabric actually has a, a pretty bad name. It doesn't really filter water. So um, in the wet season or prior to a rain event, you're removing that filter fabric. Otherwise, it will clog and flood that area. Um, so it's important to make sure that this is really an active control and it's being managed correctly. For temporary construction entrances and exits, um, we're, we're seeing the best use of essentially laying down rock of a particular size, um, uh, usually three quarters of inch, uh, I'm sorry, uh, three inch uh, rock to be laid down along with um, the rumble strips. There should be rock on either side of the rumble strips. Um, those seem to work out really well. In those areas where you have more clay type soils, what may need to be implemented is a wheel wash station. Um, that way, um, you're making sure you're not getting that track out onto the street. And then even with these controls, that entrance and exit has to be maintained on a consistent basis. We get um, 
essentially sediment clogging up the, uh, uh, the rumble strips. We still get track out going out onto the street and all of that uh, has to be cleaned up on a daily basis. Dewatering activities, you should be aware if there's dewatering activities on the sites that you're inspecting and making sure that they have the proper uh, permits for those dewatering activities. Those um, activities are associated with specific permits uh, from the regional boards. As far as uh, waste management material, liquid and storage, the key here is that you're looking for those materials that have the potential um, for discharge into the stormwater systems. So you're looking at soluble materials and liquid materials. The idea here is that all of those materials really should be kept under cover so if you do get a rain event, you're not getting that mixing of uh, uh, that rain or stormwater with those uh, different types of materials. For the smaller urban sites, um, some of the best options are like a shipping container that can fit in a couple parallel parking spaces. That's the, all the uh, construction materials can be kept in there and locked up. Either that or storing them within the uh, structure that's being constructed uh, otherwise. Um, and then there's also the options of tarping materials and putting them up on pallets um, or putting them in um, uh, small specially made containers uh, that do have secondary containment within them. Stockpile management, one of the key things to think about is the location of where the stockpiles are being implemented. If they're implemented on uh, hard, impervious surfaces, fiber rolls don't really do a great job as your uh, perimeter control around those stockpiles. And the reason for that is those uh, materials can migrate underneath them because there's not that intimate contact. You can't stake in the fiber rolls to make them effective. So for on impervious surfaces, you actually want to use gravel bags in a combination with tarps. And if it's on pervious surfaces, then you can use the fiber rolls. Those sites should also make sure that there's extra uh, gravel bags, fiber rolls, and tarps available for additional stockpiles that come into that site. Spill prevention and control. Right after you check the SWIP and have reviewed that, you should immediately ask, do they have a spill kit on site? And that should be something that's available. And all the different workers on that particular site should know where that spill kit um, is and it should be accessible so that they can get to it. Spills don't happen at the most convenient times and so we want to make sure that that spill kit is readily available and there's enough materials within that spill kit to really hinder the minor spills that go on site. The staff on site should also understand what the difference is between a minor spill and a major spill and making sure that they have the right phone contact numbers of the local agency that should be contacted, that being the fire department or, or an agency designated for cleanup assistance. And they should understand that if there's a spill of a certain size, they shouldn't try to clean it up themselves. Um, they should immediately try to call this agency and have them come out and uh, make the cleanup for them. Concrete washouts, uh, these are uh, some of the biggest issues that we continue to see. Um, per the construction general permit, these concrete washouts have to be watertight. Um, but it's also a matter of how um, these washouts are used. It's great if they're watertight, but if they're exceeding in their capacity, if they're greater than th uh, three quarters full, that's, that needs to be cleaned out because they don't have the capacity uh, for putting any more washout uh, materials in them. They should also be located away from the storm drain, away from the street gutter. Um, a lot of times we, uh, we see them uh, implemented close. And we always see that material around them that's concrete waste. That needs to be cleaned up at every different uh, use of those materials, as, uh, those facilities as well. For the smaller urban sites, there's a lot of new proprietary products that uh, can be used. Um, and then even such things as kiddie pools are good, but they, have, they can only be used as long as they have the capacity within them and that they're properly cleaned up. For um, the smaller urban sites, we see a lot of concrete activities that are actually ongoing in the street uh, adjacent to um, that particular site. And the best case scenario is to essentially all of those activities sh should be um, used with uh, tarps under all of the um, machinery that's going on. There should be perimeter controls. And then everything should be cleaned up on the, seat, on the street. We see a lot of concrete discharge on the street. All of those things should be cleaned up. Um, prior to leaving the site. As far as equipment management goes, we still see the lack of use of drip pans under equipment uh, on construction sites. And this really should be for any equipment, large or small, that has that potential to discharge 
um, liquids. So even the smallest uh, of uh, vehicles, if it has that potential to discharge oil, gasoline, hydraulic fluid, there needs to be a drip pan underneath it when it's not being used. As far as the waste management materials, um, all the dumpsters on site should have covers. If they're actively being used, that's one thing. But once they're uh, done for the day, they should be covered. That prevents if there is a storm event um, from water getting into them and leaking out and discharging those pollutants. As far as the portable toilets, they should all have under uh, drip pans underneath them. Um, uh, I understand it is an extra cost usually for the contractors to request the drip pans, but it, that's a standard requirement now that um, should be implemented for all porta potties. Okay, now I'm going to get into an interactive assessment. We're going to take a look at some pictures, and I want you all to just shout out what you see as the issues with those particular sites. I've got about uh, 20 of these different pictures to go through real quick, um, so why don't we go ahead and get started. Don't be shy. This is your participation part of the presentation. Okay, case study number one. What are some of the issues that you guys see? Construction entrance. Yep, it's, it's actually falling out into the street and there's no rumble strip. There's no defined um, area really for, for entrance and exit. Waste management, correct. You've got litter all over the place and dumpsters are over capacity. One more thing. Perimeter controls. That's right. That's, a, that's another good site. Well, they actually have a bin here, and it looks like they've got it in there. It's kind of hard to tell if, if we actually have soluble materials. But um, the last thing is perimeter controls. There's, there's no good perimeter controls. It looks like there's potentially silt fence, but it's, it's not all the way around the site. All right, next site. What do we see here? Stockpile, so uncovered, no perimeter controls around the stockpile. And guess what? It's right in the gutter, so right where it's not supposed to be. What else? How about perimeter controls? A chain link fence is not a good perimeter control, correct? Okay. What about this one? Yep, basically this is what I'm talking about. We have a, a concrete washout that is looks like it's at its capacity and we're seeing discharge outside of it that hasn't been cleaned up as well. Good looking site, right? So at least three things here that I see. So definitely we have track out. So that, that's a, a problem because there's no essentially defined uh, construction entrance and exit. No, no sediment control, so no perimeter controls, correct? There's, there's really no BMPs, and we're also looking at a non-stormwater discharge here. There's, there's enough flow there that um, there's an issue. What about this one? So there's obviously some kind of pipe that's been removed um, with, with sediment discharge from it. This is the exact wrong place to put this material. It's way too close to this storm drain inlet. And by the way, that inlet doesn't have the proper protections as well. Good or bad use of a silt fence? Yeah. Not good at all at any time because it's not designed for concentrated flows. Um, so what would be better in this situation? Check dam, exactly. What about this one? Yep, housekeeping. It's kind of hard to see here, but it's actually being kept on a concentrated uh, flow conveyance here as well. Not the right place for placing placement of trash. Have you guys seen piles like this before? <laughs> so what we see here is we see um, gravel bags as well as some older sandbags that have essentially split their guts. Um, that's a problem in itself, but it's even more of a problem because it's right next to uh, <clears throat> the drain inlet. What's the problem with the drain inlet right now? It's kind of hard to see, but filter fabric. 
So there's actually filter fabric here, but it's underneath that heavy metal grate. Well, why is that a problem? It's a problem because if you get a storm event, you gotta then pull the grate out. The filter fabric should be placed over top of it. This was taken just a few days ago, so it is the dry season. We're not really expecting rain, so it's appropriate to have that, um, but it should be placed on top of the grate. What's wrong with this stockpile? That's right, gravel bags should be used instead of the, uh, the fiber rolls. And it should be essentially all the way around that particular stockpile. Yeah, the plastic, they've got the Visqueen out there. Um, I think they knew we were coming. <laughs> but it's good they have the Visqueen there. So, you know, at the end of the day or whenever they're done using it, they're gonna put that on, but they need the gravel bags instead of the fiber rolls. Good or bad application of a drain inlet control? This is essentially not doing anything, um, except for the, maybe keeping some of the, the dust out. But as far as actually a control, we've got two gravel bags when we should probably have about 20 here. Yeah, so, so basically you're having a double bag all the way around uh, the drain inlet to make sure that you have the ability to pawn that water. One of the things to be concerned with is where you're putting this. This is actually in a roadway and making sure that you're not obstructing the traffic within that roadway as well. That's a challenge you have all the time. For the, for the permit, for the permit holder, for, for project, uh, bigger than one square, uh, you have permit, you have a plan. But when you are when dealing with a small project, you're dealing with a general permit, you cannot force contractors to the same weather. There's nothing in the same drawing. So how would you, uh, how do you enforce a contractor that you need a double bag, it has to be gravel? So, so this is actually, so the question is, how do, how do you enforce um, against the contractor when the BMP is not implemented correctly and it's not necessarily included within their their SWIP um, or their erosion center control plan. Um, their plan is wrong. And you basically identify that this needs to be updated on the plan. This is the proper implementation of this particular um, site. And if there are situations where, like, it's in a roadway and you're concerned about traffic running over this, that's what cones are for. So um, there's always a fix. And making sure, even if their plan doesn't say it, making sure that they're implementing the right kind of BMPs is, is correct. Okay, what's wrong here? That's right. So depending upon the activity on the site, there's a, a lack of erosion controls and there's definitely a lack of uh, perimeter controls and sediment controls on this particular site. There's a fiber roll here, but is it in the right place? No. It needs to be all the way around the site. Okay, there's uh, there's... Some good and bad things happening on this picture. What are the good things that are happening? That's right, he's maintaining the plates. And it's kind of hard to see, but there is gravel in front of the plates um, where that truck just went over. What's the problem though? There's not enough gravel. There's not gravel before the plates. And so the reason why this gentleman keeps maintaining this is because as the trucks drive over it, they're bringing dust with it and that's covering over the plates. If they had the rock before the plates, a lot of that dust wouldn't, wouldn't eventually get there. The good thing is that it is actually being maintained and they have the capacity within the, uh, within the plates. Good or bad use of a silt fence? Kind of hard to see here, but that is a channel and that is an inlet in the, front, in the foreground. Yeah, so it's concentrated flow, doesn't make sense. What about this particular site? It's kind of hard to tell, right? So this is a slope. There's no erosion control on it. But is it an active slope or not? If it's an active slope, then there's no issues here. But if it's been sitting there for two weeks, then there should be erosion control. So it's also understanding the time frame when you're out inspecting and asking the questions to the site operator. For some of the small sites, 
This is this is one of my favorites. It's like at least four things going on here that are an issue. You, that's right. Yep. Yep, waste management, the concrete washout isn't uh, necessarily contained. One of the biggest issues that I have is, is um, these are pervious pavers. Well, guess what? They're not pervious pavers anymore. All that concrete waste that they're not containing is now into the grout of these pavers and they will not function. So you've just made the site out of compliance with your post-construction side of things as well. about this site? Right, no perimeter controls. That's right, no secondary containment under the, uh, the porta potty. And it's kind of hard to see, but in that shadow of the porta potty, there's some kind of oily vessel that shouldn't be there, especially that close to the perimeter controls. Well, the lack of perimeter controls. <coughs> Last couple here. What would be a better situation here? You're going to have these kind of small things where you've got small amounts of, um, this is a parking lot, small amount of, of earthwork going on. The, right, so the issue here is, is that they've still got active parking spaces and people are walking through this, dropping their trash. This should really, this area should really be sectioned off so that you're not getting that discharge. Okay, four issues that I see here. That is a drain, drain inlet too. Yeah, right? Right there. So what are they? Stockpile not covered and way too close to the drain inlet. Yep, there's no, there's no, uh, Perimeter controls associated with that, with, with this site. Do you think this is a proper application of a protection of a drain inlet? No. no. And then, guess what these are? Bags of concrete. <laughs> All right. Last one. What's the problem here? Yeah. So, basically, they've used the wrong size rock here. And so it's essentially just migrated into the shaker plate and they haven't maintained it. So they need a bigger rock and they need to maintain it. Okay. Any questions before we transfer to Robin? Okay, thank you. Hi, good morning. Okay, so uh, Daniel did a really good job of going over everything for our MS4 permits and our construction general permits. Um, Jim and I are just tasked with keeping you awake for the next hour and adding a few more tools to your toolbox. Oh, one thing I wanted to say is for many of you that have been coming to this for a lot of years, um, we usually do this on the 29th and the 30th of September, and they decided to do it the first part of the month. And that really helps us out as inspectors because it reminds us of getting out there and getting our inspections done before the first, gives us a little bit more time, and hopefully with a few ideas that you've heard today can um, help you get your contractors in compliance before the start of the wet season. Um, I have a lot of slides that are real wordy. I'm not going to read them. The main reason I put them in here is so that you can take a look at that when you leave here or when you're trying to figure out a way to explain to somebody uh, what your obligation as an inspector is to enforce our permits. 
so you should know that um, in the County of Orange, we have two separate regions, Santa Ana and San Diego, approximately divided at El Toro Road, and that our stormwater program main document is the DAMP, the Drainage Area Management Plan. Every city and co-permittee of the county follows the regulations in the DAMP with it broken down into their individual local implementation plan. They work in combination to uh, meet the obligations of both of our MS4 permits. And I put this slide in here just for you guys to look at um, what all these permits are really saying. And it comes down to that the construction site discharges are the focus. And we as inspectors are out there to make sure that the contractors or homeowners are not allowing discharges to get into our MS4 permits. I'm sorry, into our MS4 per systems. And Daniel did go over this, but I think it's pretty important for each of us to understand in the permit, the legal authority is broken down to state that we need an escalating means of enforcement and that the authorized inspector, whether that be a building inspector, a grading inspector, a public works inspector, or a code enforcement inspector, we're authorized to take immediate action if there is a violation to our MS4 permit. Um, each jurisdiction has a slightly different scale for that escalating enforcement. Um, some of the cities have a written um, citation that they can give out where, you know, being a county inspector, we're not allowed to write a citation at this time. We don't have a means to do that. So you should know where your, um, your city, what the enforcement actions are, and continuing to give a verbal warning is not going to um, get compliance if you... Every time you go out there, you say, next time I'm going to um, do something next time, next time. You, you need to start to escalate it or they're going to continue to violate. And this is the specific definition of a construction site. And the main thing that I wanted to um, identify here is that it pretty much as any site where a building or a grading permit is issued because on a construction site, and it all, one of these things is going to happen. Even if you have a very small encroachment permit, they're going to be um, using concrete or stucco, you know, all the way from a very small site, single family home up to the mass grading sites, we've got the definition of a construction site. And each of the permits has a minimum requirement for every construction site. And you guys hear often an effective combination of erosion and sediment controls. And the other location that we often have uh, violations is in our waste materials management controls. So breaking down erosion and sediment, the erosion control is what's there to keep the soil in place. And the sediment control is your last line of defense and it's to eliminate the sediment from leaving the site. This, um, I drove around on Friday to some of my sites and some other people's sites. You may see pictures of your own jobs <laughs> here. Um, but I was trying to get a few pictures of some good examples and bad examples just this past week. And here we have a good example of our combination. We have a, okay, I'm gonna try to use this. There we go. Our stockpile is properly covered. The area of open soils has had a um, binder placed on it and they have the sediment controls in place. 
And in this one, you can see that there is an active stockpile that has a silt fence at the bottom with an access road. And then the slope has a binder and the um, fiber rolls and then a silt fence at the bottom. So this was a good example of the effective combination that we're looking for. I think um, anyone that's been out in the field for more than a few months can look at this list and say this is what we're commonly looking at as violations to our MS4 permits. I have a few pictures of each of these different things. And when you have the single family home construction in your jurisdiction, um, oftentimes these are the hardest to um, regulate because you're dealing with a contractor that you may or may not have on site when you go there and you've got a homeowner that has absolutely no idea what NPDS stands for or what a BMP is. And I was just going to show you this. I know Daniel talked about it a little bit, but if all of you guys don't have a copy of this construction guidance manual, everyone should at least have their own copy. And it's one of the best tools that you can use for um, homeowners or even a small contractor because it has very basically written knowledge, uh, information that explains these things. I'm hoping that we'll be um, updating it again, even though it was updated in 2012, but our new permits are now going to be in place. Um, but I actually, I mean, I looked through this a lot and I didn't actually realize there's another tool in here that um, I was gonna recommend at the end under where to look for additional information. The city of San Clemente on their website they have a best management practices for construction site single page handout and one of the pages is actually in here and the way it's written and the illustrations are very simple for anyone to understand and they're really good to be able to have to hand to people that have never heard about this stuff so they understand what, why you're out there saying that they're in violation. Um, so you can download this on the um, Orange County Watersheds webpage. I have the address at the end. Or you can get a hard copy of this by just asking Matt if he's still around. I, and I did leave a few out front because I have a box of them that I drive around with. Um, so another problem that we will run into is when you have um, developments that are phasing their construction and your inspection is down where the models are or phase one is being built and the site spreads out over into, you know, it's most likely this site is over an acre um, and you, if you go up to where they're storing their supplies you're gonna see they have a, a bin that they're using as their construction trailer. And then their supplies are kept. And you can see in this picture, there's um, a pile of asphalt and broken up concrete bags, trash. So oftentimes you have to look around the entire site, not just where your inspection is to see if they're within compliance. And this is pretty typical of uh, a large construction project. This area was building apartments. And when, it, you know, they don't think about these things when it's not raining. They're just trying to hurry up and get the work done. And you can see they've got a stockpile that's not covered. They have their BMPs that have been run over and need maintenance. And they really need to do uh, overall housekeeping. And it seems that often when you go out to um, a, a phased construction project, they'll have lots of BMPs. They'll just all be wrapped up in their plastic sitting next to the superintendent's trailer, or in this case, sitting right next to a pile that they could have actually had a BMP in place. And the picture to your right up there, um, 
shows that they're keeping their porta potty too close to their inlet that doesn't have any protection and there's no trash can available to put their construction waste in. And none of these pictures are anything that you won't see on probably any of your sites that you can go out to. Um, it's just to bring it to your awareness that we need to be out there and making sure that we're um, getting them to get out there and clean it up, especially with the wet season coming up. More often we're seeing on the larger over an acre construction general permits that they do have signs up. And most of the time it has a sign above it that says, if you see any dust leaving this site, give this number a call. I've always wondered if you did, if anyone would answer it. I haven't tried it, but um, they do have it uh, notified at this point. And here's a few examples of what Daniel was talking about earlier, our typical overrun concrete washouts. Um, the one up there on the right, actually, they're using a concrete washout and a stockpile uh, just in their boneyard. There's no perimeter controls. And the one to the left is very typical of um, phased construction where they just need three or four different locations to have a washout. And it probably was a watertight basin when they started out, but they've inundated it and now it's become kind of a trash can also. Um, mainly you just need to know that if you've got concrete gonna be poured, find out where are they gonna use for their washout? It, do they have designation of how to get there? Because the concrete truck driver isn't gonna drive all over looking for it. He needs to know exactly where it is and that they need to be maintaining it. And it seems that there's quite a few stabilized construction access out there that either if, if they're not being used, they usually look pretty nice, but if they're being used, they're not maintaining them. Um, one of the things that one of our colleagues that was presenting yesterday said is he doesn't use the term gravel with any of these uh, stabilized access. And I thought that was a really good idea because usually when you think of gravel, you're thinking one and a half, one and three quarter or two inch. And they need to be using rock, large rock, and their filter fabric, and they need to be maintaining it. Um, most often the either the erosion control plan or the Shweepy, depending on which is for the site, it has the TC1 detail there. And this is one of the easier ones that you can just pull the plan out and say it doesn't meet the requirements. Um, but it needs to be watched. And I don't want to say daily, because some sites you're not getting there daily, but you need to be looking at this area because this is the first thing that the public sees and will call on, and if you've got any um, regional board inspections going through that area, they're gonna see this from your site. And I was able to find a real good example coming off of a site, but the gates were closed and they weren't using it. <laughs> so it looked like it had been maintained well, and but there was a good size rock and um, there was a good distance off to the exit. So this one looked pretty good. And I put up here, why do we have to talk about these darn porta potties every year? Well, the main reason is because every time you go out in the field, you can find one, two, or 10 that don't have the proper containment. Um, as Daniel had mentioned, they do have to pay a little bit extra to have that containment underneath, but that's like the minimum that should be there. Um, it actually states in our permit that the containment has to be able to hold the amount of liquid that is in the, um, not in the porta potty, but it says that needs to be able to hold what you're containing. And I'm not sure that that little three inch pan could hold everything in there, but at least it's something. And we have one up there on the right that doesn't even have that. The one on the left did have the containment pan, um, but all of the BMPs that had been placed to um, protect the 
gutter there, they were all uh, broken down and needed maintenance. So I showed you guys the construction runoff guidance manual, which is available on the OC Watershed website. And um, there are a few other locations, even though we're typically talking about construction sites, the other BMP fact sheets that they have on there, such as the common interests, homeowner associations, and the residential areas have some really good um, fact sheets that can help you if you're talking to somebody that doesn't know anything about this, you can print a few of those out. The public education brochures for residents are available there. Um, and I brought a few just to take a look at. Most of the cities have them at their front counters. Uh, tips for home improvement projects and tips for protecting your watershed. These are really good, very basic um, explanations of kind of what a BMP is without calling it a BMP. And then um, mobile business, but these brochures have been put together by the county and um, the cities combined. And they're very helpful if you're talking to people um, that don't know about this and NPDES requirements. Also, some of the cities have very good websites that have NPDES pages. Um, and I was going to talk about that City of San Clemente guide, but that is in the construction guidance manual. And um, the last thing I just wanted to point out, I transferred from Public Works to OC Parks, and my colleagues uh, were giving me a hard time about going to chase the squirrels out of the porta potties at the parks. And this just happens to be a funny. Um, violation that the rodents are causing at one of our parks. They're, the gophers are digging holes and all of their dirt piles are going into the gutter and the, um, ter the terminating contractor refuses to remove the dirt because he's only there to remove the gophers. And so now I had to get our ranger staff to go out there and follow the terminating contracted to make sure we don't have a violation of the NPDES permit. So um, so I put my email address up there because I wanted to tell you guys about a couple other um, publications that I get. Um, the Monthly Dirt is a magazine for um, that's written by a, a QSD up in Lodi, California. And um, he sends out an email, and every every month it has an example of a, a different uh, BMP, and it talks about implementing the general construction permit, and it's very kind of fun, is what I'll say. Um, this last one talked about putting together the annual report and kind of had guidelines on doing that if you do that for your city, and also... Um, identified the Stormwater Awareness Week, which is coming up the 26th through the 30th. If any of you need to get um, PDUs or CEUs, um, he has one-hour classes. They're all free. And by the end of last year, I, I did go on and, and watch a couple just to get um, some credits for it. Um, by the time it's really close to the classes, there's usually some really good ones for inspectors to um, hear somebody else in our field in the state of California talking about their area. So if anybody's interested in getting that, because I tried to Google it and it doesn't bring up, it's called the, um, the monthly dirt, but it doesn't bring it up easily. So I'll, I'll be willing to send it to you if anybody was interested in it. And thank you. Robin. All right, now we're going to have Jim Murray with the city of Huntington Beach. Thank you for the introduction, Daniel, and uh, thank you for having me here this morning to talk to you guys about um, 
construction inspections, basically from the point of view of uh, municipal agencies inspect inspector. Um, I, was, I didn't quite volunteer. I was actually uh, volunteered by my boss, right? <laughs> Voluntold, yeah, yeah. But the, I heard the checks in the mail, though, right? <laughs> so, anyways, with that, uh, let's move on. Uh, these are topics I'll be going over um, throughout my presentation, starting with the inspector's responsibility, meaning when you show up to a site, uh, what are your responsibilities as an inspector, and not only when you show up, but also when you leave the site, whether what are the inspect uh, your responsibilities as an inspector. Um, briefly touch on the BMPs for all construction sites. Uh, mostly this has kind of been be beaten to death, so I'll just kind of glance over that real quick. Um, and then move on to inspections of atypical construction sites or projects. And these are projects that are uh, not your conventional uh, projects or construction sites, and many of them don't even require a permit, so they kind of fly under the radar, but they can be very problematic, uh, even more so than some of the other projects uh, where your contractors have an understanding. It's also many times written in their permit about what BMPs are required to be implemented, so they have a good understanding of what your expectations are. So when you show up, they kind of understand and speak your language. But these other smaller projects, uh, they really don't. Um, and then I'll go over BMPs for public projects and why it's so important uh, to implement them, um, and also why it should uh, be implemented not only to give uh, contractors an idea of what your expectations are, but it's a perception issue as well. And then the new frontier is dealing with EFIS. EFIS is Exterior Insulation Finishing Systems. Um, I think this is a new frontier uh, in relation to mostly commercial developments. I've seen this within the last two or three years where a lot of uh, projects using this material instead of stucco for the exterior. Um, it provides good insulation, lightweight, it can be used on non-load bearing walls, um, and it's really easy to work with, but it can be disastrous if uh, there's not appropriate BMPs implemented. Um, and then briefly touch on waste management BMPs, things that we run across on a daily basis as related to smaller projects. So starting with uh, definition construction site, Robin kind of went over this, same with Daniel. So any site... The, where you have stockpiling, uh, excavation, clearing, road uh, construction, structural demolition, or even construction. So this is also includes projects that don't have permits. So if you've got a landscaping project, there is disturbance of soil, there's grading, there's grubbing, that is considered a construction site. So you'll be expected to inspect that just as much as you are, uh, just as frequent as you would for a smaller site. So either once during a wet season or as needed during a dry season. So, uh, so like I said, typical projects um, under the definition of construction site, those would be your single family developments, pool construction, uh, roadway repair. Those are the type of construction uh, projects that we normally think of when you, th when you hear construction site. But then you got your non-typical uh, or your atypical projects. Those are your landscaping projects, uh, concrete flat work, uh, tenant improvement projects. A lot of those don't require any permits, so they fly under radar, but like I said, they can cause a lot of problems, even more so than some of your other uh, typical construction projects. So starting with inspector's responsibility, when you show up to the site, um, you're looking at not only whether the BMPs are being implemented, but also uh, the timing when they're implemented. It's ex most projects are phased, so in certain phases, you'll expect to see perimeter controls when there's grading, uh, once they've started uh, stabilizing the area and they moved on into the sticks, then you want to see a concrete washout. Uh, so you want to see that it's been implemented in a phased manner as uh, the project progresses. But also, you're looking at the effectiveness of the BMPs. So you're looking at the uh, written versus practical application. So it may look great on paper, but we all know sometimes in the field it doesn't work as well. Um, so these plans have to be can be, it should be adjusted to reflect the current conditions of the site. So if it's not working, you should be able to go back to the project engineer and require them to uh, beef up the BMPs or add additional controls. Um, and then also, if you find there's any deficiencies, you are required to document the deficiencies. Um, so that includes photographic evidence. Um, it, that really helps you as well so that when you have to go back and understand you know, where the issues were, you can have a clear understanding what the issues are, um, and then also when you follow up, you can see where pre and then post BMP implementation. And then also when you do have any uh, situation where you have violations, you are required to uh, issue an enforcement action. 
It could be just as simple as a written warning, and I typically issue those for violations where the contractor can correct them before I leave the site. So, you know, if it's minor things like uh, sweeping up uh, right around the entrance and exit, uh, simple things. But if it requires me to come back out, I'm definitely going to write it down so that we both have a clear understanding when I come out that this is what the corrections are required and also provide an, uh, a due date for when your corrections are expected to be done. Because if you just leave it blank and open, they're gonna wait till the very last minute or even right before you show up, or they may say, well, you weren't clear on when you were asking for these to be implemented. So you have to have a clear understanding when the BMPs are to be implemented. Um, and this is can uh, vary, so it can be weather dependent or situational. So it may vary, so whether you know, if it's tracking controls and they're no longer using that exit, you can wait till you know they start using that exit for them to implement or beef up their tracking control BMPs as long as they sweep the street and keep it clear. Um, however, if you've got perimeter controls that are in really poor shape and you've got impending rain, you know, later on that afternoon, you're going to expect them to have their perimeter controls uh, secure and in place before the rain starts. So it's it's dependent on the weather and the conditions. So it's there's no clear cut. Timing in, in terms of, you know, it should be three days or 72 hours, whatever. It's, it's all dependent on the, the situation and also the weather as well. So continuing on with the inspection responsibilities, um, there should be coordination between departments. Um, I know we, as far as City Huntington Beach, we have different inspectors uh, from Public Works and also our building inspectors. Um, so you'll see during the initial phase where there's grading, um, you see a public works inspector on site, um, and they were responsible for implementing the BMPs, or actually not implementing, but actually uh, inspecting the BMPs and effectiveness. And then when it gets into the building phase, then the building inspectors would be responsible for that. So there's got to be a clear line of communication, especially if it's a problematic site and there's issues. Um, you have to have a line of communication between the inspectors. That's critical. Otherwise, if, not, if one hand doesn't know what the other hand is doing, especially if you've got both inspectors working different phases of the project, uh, if there is miscommunication, if they see the same type of violation, and now written warning is issued by one inspector and uh, uh, verbal is issued by another, and they have different due dates, you know, that, that could be a very problematic. And then uh, it would be a bad reflection on your program in the city as well. It seems like you guys don't know what you're doing. Uh, so you've got to have some kind of communication between your departments. Um, and it really helps if you have the same kind of forms in a, a central area where the forms go to. If there's one person that handles your MPDS program that handles that and can view the reports and be able to understand what's going on um, and then correlate and coordinate as, as, as necessary. Um, so, and then also if you have a erosion control sediment plans, both inspectors should be looking and reviewing that and not basing their uh, uh, inspections and recommendations, not recommendations, but inspection and, and report writing based on uh, experience or, or their own intuition. It should be related directly to the permit and the plans if there's erosion control, sediment control plans for that site. All right, so like anything, planning is key to successful implementation. So this is a good example of, of how planning, uh, really poor planning. Uh, you can see what happens here. You got a telephone pole that wasn't probably on somebody's uh, design plans, but uh, it, it ended up on the road, you know. So that's, that's what we're talking about is that you have to understand uh, the lay of the land and when you put in this inspection or actually uh, erosion control plans. Um, and a clear understanding uh, of what the BMPs should be implemented and addressing not only the runoff issues, but also the run-on. So if you're in a site that you're downhill from a residential project or residential uh, uh, development, and that residential development has a lot of overwatering issues and runoff that may impact your site, you have to understand that as well and be able to deal with that. Um, and so that, that's, that's why Planning is key to success. And then also, engineered plans um, may not work in the field. So you have to be uh, flexible in that sense. All right, so going on to inspection of atypical construction sites and how it's so important. A lot of times, like I said, these, these type of projects fly under radar because they're usually short in duration, maybe a week or two. Uh, typically, no permits are issued for like landscape projects or flat work, if it's concrete, uh, resurfacing of a driveway or installing pavers at a, at a residence or even a commercial development. So 
we tend to overlook at the, these, and sometimes we have no idea they're ongoing until we get a complaint that there's a discharge of mud running in the street or somebody's mixing concrete in the curb and gutter adjacent to a, a catch basin. But this is a perfect example. This is actually photos from a construction, actually not a construction site. This is a, a sod repair project, a typical landscaping project in Kentucky. And you can see how it's a pretty small site in relation to um, majority of, of sites. But so you see the runoff after a rain event. It's not a really heavy downpour. I think it was like less than an eighth of an inch. But you clearly see how it can impact the parking lot first in that first picture and then into the adjacent catch basin. But then look what happens to the uh, adjacent, when receiving water body. It's a clear impact. And this is just a small landscaping project. So there are situations like this, not always, but where your atypical construction or your non-conventional uh, construction sites can be more problematic than your uh, other development or construction projects because they typically don't have a permit. There is no erosion sediment control plans for them to follow. And the, con the, contra the contractors are not familiar with our expectations in relation to erosion and sediment controls, waste management. So you have to go out there and educate them and show them, or not show them, but help them understand what your expectations are. And um, we are required to actually inspect these types of sites. So this is another one here in our, uh, that occurred in our city last uh, winter. So this is right before a rain event. Uh, this is a landscape project and also a project where they're constructing a decorative pool. But uh, you can see how all the stockpiles right adjacent to that, that uh, curb and gutter area, there would be nothing to prevent all that material from ending up into the, the nearest catch basin. So in this situation, within that day or the following day, we had them uh, put some perimeter controls, sweep up the curb and gutter, uh, place a drip pan underneath the porta potty, and then also protect the uh, catch basin. What you don't see here, too, is up further on the street on, to the picture on your, on your right. There's actually uh, check dams as well to uh, help uh, control and uh, limit the amount of sediment that actually enters into that catch basin there. And then uh, this, so inspection landscape projects, um, like Daniel spoke about and also Robin, implementation is not uh, adequate. It has to, the BMPs have to be maintained throughout the project. So it's not one of those things where you set it and forget it, you know, walk away once it's set. Um, this is a typical project uh, where you've got BMPs installed at one point in time, but they've deteriorated to the point where they're ineffective at all and actually become a problem now because what's to prevent that hay water from being washed into the nearest catch basin and causing a flooding problem? So implementation is, uh, I mean, uh, maintenance is, is just as important as implementation. So because if you don't maintain it, it, it's sometimes even worse than not having those type of BMPs, whether you've got broken sandbags, now you've got a debris issue with the, the plastic from the, the mesh and the, the gravel bags ending up in the catch basin or into your uh, uh, receiving water body. So it's just as important to have maintained throughout duration of project. So this is kind of overkill, but uh, this is uh, what we see. Sometimes, what we'd like to see in our landscaping projects. There on the on the left, you see uh, a small uh, landscaping project. The problem with this is that this project was ongoing for almost two years, and every time it rained, we have mud in the gutter, and uh, it, so eventually we required the homeowner to place some kind of perimeter controls until they figured out what they wanted to do with the landscaping and finally got it done after that. So, but that's what we want to see. And then you see a commercial application of commercial landscaping project. Um, that is really effective in preventing any sediment discharge. And that's what you'd like to see. I mean, but this, this is a, a really good example and you're not going to run across this very often. So, but this is ideally what we want to see. All right. So, <laughs> This is uh, also typical. This is a, a block wall project um, and also a stucco finish to the block wall. You can see the contractor here. He's, he's only going to be there maybe for four hours, five hours. But look at the mess he's left. And he was just getting ready to leave. And he was like, what, what's the problem? Why are you stopping me? <laughs> I don't see the problem. They're like, well, who's going to clean this up? Uh, I don't know. See, isn't street sweeping tomorrow? <laughs> this is not going to work. So uh, that's, that's where we have to be the educators and go out there um, and address this. Typically, it's not in a proactive fashion. We usually uh, find out about these problems after somebody's already complained, so it's in a reactive manner. But hopefully, you've educated them so that when they do the next project or go to the next site, that they'll have a clear understanding 
what your expectations are and so that this doesn't repeat itself. Um, so we did cite the guy and had him pay for all the cleanup. So I, I think that kind of hurt him um, and helped him understand that we're serious about this. This is what we'd rather see. This is exactly what we'd rather see, where you've got uh, minimization of any contact of any stucco, any stockpile of any material with the surfaces um, on the street, because no matter what, how often or how hard you sweep, that street will never go back to the original condition prior to the construction project. Because it's just going to be uh, some residue or something else left that will be washed down in the storm drain. So minimizing contact is important. So something like this would be if perfectly effective where they've got uh, tarps covering and protecting the catch base. I mean the, uh, the curb and gutter, the street itself, and a stockpile of sand um, and other material is right on the tarp itself. So that when they do get ready to leave the site, just simply uh, wrap up the tarp um, and, and it's just like they, ha they weren't even there. So that's what we want to see. And then even uh, for another type of atypical projects, these are your utility installations. This is a simple gas line uh, meter or a gas and meter in installation project. But this continued, it was supposed to be a two day project, but it continued on for a week. Um, so the excavated spoils, we wanted to see them cover it, and protect it. And this is exactly what we want to see. So these are your projects that normally you wouldn't come across uh, as an inspector, but this is what you should be looking for and expecting out of these contractors for projects like this. And then moving on to public, or uh, uh, BMPs for public works projects and how important it is. This is a perception problem. If you have the public sees, that sees a, a, a project look like this, how, how, how serious do you think they're, they're gonna think about your program? You know, when you have a site that looks like this, this is your own construction site, and uh, you wanna enforce your BMPs or your expectations on a private development or a private contractor and you've got a site that looks like this, how seriously do you think they're gonna take you? And then also, especially when it comes to enforcement actions, you know, are they gonna, they're gonna ask you, did you enforce, did you ha have the same expectations and are you gonna enforce the same thing at, uh, on the, your sites as you are on my sites? So it's a perception thing. You have to go above and beyond um, to show that this, your program is serious. Um, this is another example here where this looks really, really poor. Right after a revane event, um, I'm sure you had a lot of mud and debris that ended up in the street and to the curb and gutter. So it, it is a, a perception issue. Your city's uh, projects should be above and beyond and above re reproach. And this, this is not adequate or acceptable at all. Um, and so it, it, it's a perception thing. So this is what it should have been done. So the next day, of, obviously after the rain, <laughs> when they're not needed, well actually they are needed, but uh, you know, this would have been ideal if it had been done before the rain. But this is what it should have happened. This is what uh, your contractor and the general public should have seen when they drove by the site. Um, and here's the other site as well. So this is what, this, this shows that you take your program serious and it's not something that you're imposing on your contractor arbitrarily that you're actually implementing on your own sites and your own projects. And so uh, what we've done in Huntington is uh, we get every so often, every six months or so, we get a list of all the capital projects and we do a plan review or just uh, to see whether they would be required to implement either a full SWIP, uh, meaning that they would have to apply for uh, coverage of a general construction permit. Uh, or just a project specific SWIP. So we don't run across these problems because what happens is if you were to go in and tell the contractor now you've got to implement all these BMPs, now it's considered a change order. You know, and now you're footing the bill for them having to implement these BMPs. So you want to cut, catch it on the front end, on the design or on the spec end, uh, when you're specking out the project. So when the contractor is bidding for the project, they understand exactly what they're bidding on. And so that when you show up to the site, um, they, they can't deny that they didn't know that this was expected of them and that this would be a change order if they required to implement these erosion and sediment control BMPs and, or other, any other BMPs. So um, it, it definitely to your benefit and also to the benefit of the contractor as well. So they have a clear understanding what your expectations are and uh, when you go out there that you expect this to be implemented in a timely fashion. Yes. Mm -hmm. putting the beneficial language in your contract. So when you send out your RFPs, RFQs, and execute those contracts, it's actually already 
Right, exactly, yes. Kind of like boilerplate language? Yes, yeah. Uh, yeah, we do have some boilerplate language that's on the plan sets, but we prefer also write it into the bid specs so they completely have, have, a, have an idea of what we're expecting and so that when they bid it, they bid it right because sometimes the, uh, it's a totally different group that sends out the bids versus the engineers that review the plans. So you want to make sure that their two sides are talking and so that we have it in both documents. Uh, boilerplate for the uh, engineer design plans and also in the specs so that when they are bidding for the project they have an understanding that this these type of uh, best management practices are required for the project. All right, any other questions? Does, does any other city do anything something like that or similar fashion? Alex, yeah. All right, and instead of making 12 BMPs, um, this is also related to projects that, it, that encroach on public right away. So I know this came up earlier where you've got uh, catch basin protection BMPs and limit protection BMPs that protrude into the public right of way. Um, in this situation like this, you have to kind of uh, sit back and assess a public safety versus environmental protection. In this sense, is if it's intruding out into public right of way and you've got pedestrians or actually in this case it would be a bike lane that's being maybe uh, uh, intruded upon, um, how, <laughs> how long before all those bags get run over and then also how long before you've got potential accident building up. So in certain instances we've allowed something like what you see on the right there if it's a project that doesn't have a lot of soil disturbance where now you've got the catch basin BMPs that are sitting f closer or flush to the curb face. Um, and in many instances, they are just as effective as um, having the whole inlet protected in a fashion like you see on the left. So there are certain situations that you can go around doing that. And uh, they, I mean, it's not as effective, but you also don't have to worry about, you know, uh, ponding and flooding on streets and then also pedestrian uh, and uh, cyclist-related accidents. And that, that's, that's where you have to kind of especially if it's in a public right of way, the city will be held liable. If we permit something like this and an inspector came out and looked at this and they can document it um, and then there's an accident, um, the city could be liable for having something like this, especially if it's, even if you put delineators and markers, uh, it'll be problematic. So it's something to consider. Yeah, fiber rolls typically work best if they're uh, trenched in and staked down. Uh, the problem with fiber rolls is that uh, water can go directly under them. And so on a, f on a hard surface, they're not as effective. Uh, now, if you put fiber rolls and, and with a sandbags on top of them to hold them down, to weight them down, that, that would be more effective and uh, could achieve. Now, these bags here are really heavy gravel bags, um, so there's really no chance for water to go under them. Um, it, water will have to overtop the, the bags um, and so you give that time for the water to desilt and then hopefully clean water to go over the top and that's what you're trying to do you're not trying to filter the water that's so to us it doesn't matter if you use sandbags or gravel bags because they're not designed to filter the water all they are designed to do is just uh, uh, detain the water and allow the sediment to uh, drop out and then clean water to overtop the bags or your inlet protection system. So it's, it doesn't matter to us. Uh, we don't like to use dirt though, no dirt bags, because <laughs> they're mesh and it'll go right through and then you'll have another, uh, it'll just contribute to the, to the sediment loading. Yes? Oh, that's notes from, my, from uh, our inspector. Uh, there was uh, an issue with the site, and it was, there was a lot of mud and sediment collected. It, oh, that's gravel. It's a heavy gravel bag. It's, uh, it's, it's called uh, Gutter Buddy is the name of it. Um, so there are other products out there that are maybe not as effective, but close to being as effective as uh, conventional. You've never seen one? Yeah. So there, I would say I've seen them more within the last three or four years, so more often. Um, it's a heavier rock, not not just be, yeah, yeah. So it's 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 pretty heavy bag, and it's designed to be really heavy and weighty, so that water can't go underneath. 
the bags. All right. Any other questions? Can we move on. Yes. Yeah, you see, um, that, that's an excellent idea, but the problem with that is that you don't want to get in, into uh, being very prescriptive and recommending certain uh, BMPs because what happens is if, if it fails, now they're going to look at you like, well, you told me to use this. I'm not spending any more money to go buy something else when you told me that I need this or you wrote this into my plan. So all you want to do is you want to give them general ideas um, and give them uh, 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 maybe a, a, a selective suite of things that they or BMPs that would work just as effectively and let them decide what works best for them, whether it's cost uh, or, or uh, the way the project is laid out. But you don't want to be very sp uh, prescriptive because if it doesn't work, then they're going to look at you to find solutions to their problem. Then you start working for them, you know, and that's <laughs> unless you get a paycheck, and then that leads to other issues. But you don't want to be working for them. All you want to do is you want to guide them to the right place, help them decide what works best for them, and then go from there. But yeah, if you go, if you become very prescriptive, then that becomes your problem. You inherit that problem. So we all we do is basically just recommend, uh, you know, lists of catch basin BMPs that they can use, and then they can determine up to themselves what works for their site. And as long as it's effective, that's all we care about. We don't care what we use as long as it's effective. That's all we care about. All right, let's move on. All right, so this is the, the new frontier. And I, I'm bringing this up because I've seen this within the last two, three years. Um, and it's a major problem. And also because um, I don't think any working groups like Casco have dealt with something like this or in similar uh, uh, nature in terms of the violations that uh, potential problems. But EFIS is exterior insulation finishing surfaces. And uh, what it does is basically a combination of polystyrene, uh, uh, gra graphite, or, or fiberglass mesh to hold it together. And it gives you a really easy product to work with other than stucco, uh, even, even easier than stucco for exterior finishes, especially on non-load bearing walls. So where you sometimes stucco may be too heavy to put on certain uh, decorative walls or things like that, um, they're starting to use uh, EFIS. Um, and so you're, I'm seeing a lot more of, of this product here. And it was, even though it's been uh, developed in Europe a long time ago and they've been uni using it for decades, um, it's becoming more common here in the United States, especially with the LEED certification. The, this gives you an easy way to insulate your building without having to install a bunch of insulation um, you can wrap your building with this uh, polystyrene uh, 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 finish that gives you uh, good um, insulation for heating and cooling um, and helps you achieve the LEED certification. So right now, I've seen a lot more in, in commercial. I haven't, really haven't seen it in a residential application, but also in not so much for LEED, but, but for decorative finishes like the rounded bulwarks, uh, decorative walls and things like that. Uh, I'm seeing a lot more of that, but it consists of polystyrene, fiberglass mesh, and synthetic base coat. So the problem with this is that uh, this is what it looks like in, in uh, application form. So that on the left there you see is um, basically they put a nice decorative finish on this wall here, exterior wall, and that's uh, let me see, where's the pointer? Do we have a pointer? Uh, Robin, you stole the pointer. Never mind. Oh, here it is. So this here is, is all polystyrene. Um, so what they're trying to do is trying to shape it and give it a nice good surface and then they're gonna lay some more decorative brick on top of this in a different color than scheme than this. Uh, but this is what happens when they, sh they start shaving it down. Oops. So this is what you get. All this uh, styrofoam, shavings all over the ground, all over the site, uh, and it blows, and uh, it's a huge problem because 
Styrofoam doesn't degrade. So unlike most other uh, construction-related uh, pollutants, they have a, a short lifespan. Um, so like sediment, you know, once once it's uh, discharged in the receiving water body, it, flows, it goes to the bottom. You know, and its effect is, is temporary and there's a shorter lifespan. But this stuff, this, this styrofoam, will outlive us, our grandkids, and generations and generations, thousands of years. So it's a problem that will continue way after the project's been completed. So, and the hardest thing is there is no easy way to clean it up. So on a site like this, you can't put a broom to it. As soon as you go to put a broom to it, it blows all over the place. Um, any prevailing winds will carry it from your, this site to another, to, to adjacent properties. And it's impossible now. Are you going to climb somebody's backyard, clean it out of their pool? What are you going to do? So you've got to think about this in advance. So, I mean, this is uh, another example. This is an Arby's uh, where they finished the exterior wall. Um, it's just a tenant improvement. Added some uh, new... Um, glass and then also the exterior uh, finish there but throughout the whole parking lot you see the picture on the right there was all this styrofoam on the ground all of these particulates all over the ground across the street to the uh, adjacent built uh, uh, commercial property yes Right. Yes. So he's also seen it on a commercial, on residential application. Right. So that's what I'm getting into. What what you you have to do, and this is something that you have to think about in advance. Um, yeah. This is right before the Arby's actually burned down. Was it this week? Same <laughs> thing. Maybe that's. Um, so this is another application here. This is a Chase Bank um, where they're using the same material, and it often comes in pallets, kind of what you see here. And then it has to be cut and shaped. Um, some of the material is already preformed pre um, according to their specs, but a lot of times it just comes in big giant blocks that they have to cut and shape it to fit and form whatever portion of the wall or um, whether it's a window that they're forming around. So there's a lot of cutting that's involved in, in shaping, um, and that's where you get the problem. And then you see the guy on the right. Um, this is after I issued them a citation to clean up the, the mess, um, not only in their site, but also their, the parking lot adjacent to the project. But that way he's doing it by hand, that's the only effective way. Once it gets in the dirt and the gravel, you, you can't vacuum it up. Otherwise, you're going to vacuum the whole entire gravel bed or, or all, all that sediment. So he had to pick each and every single styrofoam bit by hand and it took about 20 or 30 laborers and they were on it for almost a week straight so i came by every day and uh but still and they still i would say got less than half of the material because anytime the wind blows yeah what are you going to chase it you know two miles down the street um uh, yeah it's impossible so if you don't have a plan in advance before you use this material there's no way you can clean it up so you've got to have a plan going in um so if you see something like this and the problem is that a lot of this material, I mean, uh, uh, material doesn't show up on the grading plan for most public work inspectors. It's only after they've started using it that you start to see the problem. And so that's where it becomes a problem is uh, we don't have any idea until they actually start using the material that uh, they're using EFIS for their project site. Right. Yes. Right. <laughs> So right now, maybe something that Casco can take on is develop something that uh, maybe a BMP or a fact sheet, because right now there isn't any guidance documents. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So in this case, this is another Chase Bank. I think they kind of learned from their mistakes um, on that first project. So same contractor, but what they did was they used big tarps to, and uh, uh, plastic sheeting to contain the waste where they were cutting and applying and shaping it. But what they didn't do was uh, contain it around the entrance of the nexus. So every time somebody walked out, uh, it blew right out, you know, and it was, it was going inside the and interior areas, and there's no way to clean it out. And any time the wind blew, um, so this is... So you've also got to think not only in containment, but also full containment and also almost treat it like asbestos or lead abatement, where you've got to have a decontamination area for the entrance and exit way so that when people walk in and out, it doesn't allow it to blow all over the place. 
and become a problem uh, because it's impossible to clean it up. So advanced planning is necessary. So this on the right you see is a, 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 a plan that a, one of our developers came up. They're building a, a, a tower, an eight-story tower, six to eight-story tower, um, right across the street from the beach on PCH. And they're going to use EFIS for the entire exterior structure. So before they did that, we sat down, basically myself and the uh, building inspector, and we wanted to see what they would do in terms of containing and preventing that material from ending up on our beaches or all over town. I mean, because if you're 68 stories high, that stuff can blow for miles. Um, so they came up with a work plan. And this is what you have to do is if you've got a large site like this or even a site, a commercial site like a bank, they have to develop a plan to address this. And right now there is no fact sheet. So um, and it also has to be uh, specific to the site. <coughs> Excuse me. So this is what they developed. Um, and so what they're going to do basically is they're going to implement uh, a system where they're going to in fully encase two stories at a time and have it completely wrapped where the workers will go in it during the day, in the morning, uh, and then they don't leave that area until the end of the day when the work day when they get ready to wrap everything up. So there's nobody walking in and out. There's no egress points. There's no exit points. It's going to be completely encapsulated. So they've got a drop cloth with uh, plastic sheeting, um, and then it, they've got mesh screening to, to as a, act as a wind uh, breaker, and then plastic underneath that. So that because if you have you know layers and layers and acres, it's pretty much uh, a lot of square feet of, of, of uh, uh, plastic sheeting, it becomes like a kite. So you've got to break that wind so it doesn't tear your seams apart, and then now you've got all the, the, the EFIS and uh, material ending up where you didn't want to end up. So they had to develop this plan, and also what they're doing now is, I guess, Hilti and some of the other larger tool manufacturers are creating, or I think Hilti is the first one now, is they have a shaping tool. Instead of shaping by hand or with... Uh, a sandpaper or other materials. They have a shaping tool that has a vacuum attachment that hooks up to the back. So as they're shaping, it actually recovers as m maybe up to 80% of the uh, shaving so that you're collecting at the point of, of the, the, the pollution versus trying to collect it in a corner somewhere or even on the bottom of the tarp. Uh, and the, that makes it a lot easier. Like I said, you have to treat it like asbestos or lead paint removal and abatement. Yes, Shane. It, it can be treated just as regular trash. It is. It goes landfills. It's not hazardous waste. It's styrofoam. Um, there, it's not a special waste of so designated hazardous waste. So it can be disposed of as trash. Now, you want, definitely want to keep lid on your trash bins. It's one thing to put put it all in there, and if you leave the lids open, it's going to end up all over your site. So, uh, what they've also done is they're going to have roll-offs with covers, uh, not just tarps, but covers that would keep the material contained in there um, so that it doesn't disperse off-site as well. Yep. Also, when they're hauling it off, I'm sorry. No, go ahead, Matt. Is that a community project? Has that begun? Have they implemented that, or is that a community project? They're actually going to start in a month. Okay. Yeah, so they haven't started yet. But we wanted to see an advanced plan so that they have a clear, we have a clear understanding and are comfortable with their procedures. But obviously, um, we're going to check to make sure it's effective as well. So, I mean, it may look great on paper, but um, if it's not effective, then we'll ask them to go back to the drawing board and Im implement additional controls um, if necessary. All right. Uh, so dealing with EFIS, continuing on. Uh, the biggest problem comes from cutting and shaping. So a lot of times you see guys cutting and shaping on the roof, on the side of the building, exposed to uh, prevailing winds. Um, and cutting it with a handsaw, so you can imagine every time they put a blade to it, you see all these particulates coming off the, the big block or whatever portion that they have. Um, so at minimum, they should do all their cutting and, and if they can, do some of the shaping um, in an area that's fully enclosed. So you, where you don't have any winds coming in and out, your entrance and exits are away from where any prevailing winds would be, so then you're not, and then also you're not tracking it out. The problem is when it gets really dry, you have a lot of static, that stuff clings to your clothes, your boots, um, any material they've got on, and it gets tracked out. 
and blows right off. So you've got to take that into consideration. Excuse me. All right, so this is what they should use, is a hot wire electric saw, something like that. So where it's just like a, a knife going through, a hot knife going through butter. There is no uh, particulates generated. It just seem, cuts through the, 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 the EFIS box um, easily, and it does, so you don't have any of that material breaking off and become a problem. So that's what they should use. You should not allow them to hand cut it or shape it by hand if possible. Then this is typical application. So you've got this guy on the roof. I mean, there's nothing to prevent the wind from blowing all this material, and he's hand shaping it. Um, what you can't see is in the right hand he has a, basically like a, it's a shaping tool, um, which is basically just like sandpaper um, and also a little blade that goes along with it. And so all those particulates, you know, when the wind picks up, it's going to blow all over the place. There's nothing to contain it on its site. Um, there's nothing to prevent it from blowing down the street and to the adjacent properties and sites. So the problem is a lot of the stuff, um, actually almost all, if not all, EFIS is done on exterior surfaces. Now, the interior, if it was interior, it'd be uh, less of a problem, but this is all done on exterior surfaces. And also, it's done, it's implemented or uh, used on roofs as well as insulation to, uh, to help achieve uh, the lead ratings system. So, that's the biggest problem is that it has to be done on exterior surfaces and it, you, it's impossible to contain. So this is what we would like to see. This is a uh, commercial application. Uh, actually, it's just a residential. Um, full containment, limit entrance and exit, secondary containment. Um, you don't want to have any of the particulates hit any surface that's not hard that you cannot sweep or that you cannot vacuum. If you can't vacuum or sweep it, then you can't pick it up. What are you going to pick it up? Well, like we saw that guy, each piece by hand, you know, one at a time. So, and then even that, like I said, it's not effective. They probably got less than half of the particulates. Um, so you've got to do it in an area where you can control the waste once it's generated and be able to easily clean it up. Yes? Mm -hmm. Right. But that's, that's where I'm going to the next picture. Uh, this is a better application for commercial developments where you've got windscreen. Well, either that or deal with the fallout having to clean all that mess up. You know, it, if it costs them, huh? Yes. Right. It, it'll be tough, and uh, that's something we have to consider. I think this, this is the next frontier. Uh, because I'm seeing this more and more, whereas, you know, 10 years ago, I, I never saw or ran across EFIS at all. And now it's almost every other project, you'll see some kind of EFIS application. It should be. It could be. Uh, but the, a lot of times this goes through the building department, and they have a different set of eyes than, you know, the, the public works or even environmental uh, folks do. So they don't have a clear understanding of what's going on and don't understand that this is a problem. So this is something that I think holistically the whole, uh, even starting all the way up to the BIA and, and those groups, you know, all the way up in the skies, um, start looking at and, and figure out a method and means and, and then uh, uh, maybe even some general best management practices that we can point to and not have to, uh, you, know, you know, develop these plans for the, the developer or the contractor. All right. Um, and that's it, pretty much. No, no, it's not unreasonable. If they're not going to do it right, then uh, your best tool is start uh, implementing enforcement action, starting with citations that we have done. Um, and I think the best tool you have in your in your toolbox would be issuing stop work notices. You know, a, a citation, okay, 125, 500, whatever. They're, you know, they, they can just, you know, uh, incur those kind of costs and move on like nothing. But you issue a stop work notice where nobody's working. I mean, if nobody's working, nobody's eating. And they're going to get really serious. That's, that's, that's your best tool. Uh, and so with that kind of threat, I think you, uh, it shows how serious you are. And this is, this is a serious problem. And not only that, but also they have to deal with the neighbors. Oh, actually, you probably have to deal with the neighbors' complaints as well. You know, if this gets to somebody's koi pond um, and the koi fish eat this, um, like we had a, a similar problem not too long ago, and they die, <laughs> who's going to pay for this fish? 
You know, who's going to deal with that? You know, he gets in somebody's house and you've got a hypochondriac who lives across the street and now it's causing him cancer and it's your fault because you let it happen. So you want to deal with it preemptively rather than reactively because there is no clean way to address this once it's become a problem and dispersed off-site. Any other questions? Yes. No, we don't care. Right, and they figure out how they clean it up. Yeah, let them dictate. You know, they made the mess. They can figure out how they clean it up. Yeah, we will not tell them how we want to clean it up, but we will tell them the standards we expect to have it cleaned up too. So you know, we want to see it before in the same condition before they started construction. So that that's that's the only guidance we'll give them, and they can figure out how they can um, clean it up. You know, so that the Chase banker he had to hire twenty or thirty laborers almost for a week clean up the site and because they'd just gone off site and it's just failure to plan in advance. You know, if you had maybe one or two laborers on they were just tasked with keeping containment, uh, making sure that they were cutting it inside or in some kind of enclosed area, you wouldn't have to deal with those costs and incur that type of uh, uh, expense, you know, so and deal with that issue, uh, you know, all the negative press and public uh, perception issues as well. With that, I'll just wrap it up unless we have more questions. All right, thank you. Thank you, Daniel. Great presentation. I learned something today, so that was really good. I think uh, maybe maybe CASCA can provide some support in providing guidance. I think that would be good to get this to the CASCA uh, construction subcommittee. So I got a couple, five more minutes on uh, enforcement case study, and then we'll let you. We'll get you guys out of here. Okay, uh, just real quick, uh, just want to go through uh, an ACL that was issued to the county uh, last year, um, or actually uh, a couple years ago. Um, so basically this was uh, a violation with both the uh, the MS4 permit as well as the construction general permit. This is the Lincoln Avenue widening project. So I'm just going to go through some of the issues that were identified in the ACL. So um, first one was uh, failure to employ con controls and structures to minimize and prevent litter on site. Um, we know how dirty construction sites can be. Uh, failure to store chemicals in watertight containers. Um, so that's, that's always an issue. Um, exposure of construction materials to rainfall. Again, you're looking for those construction materials that have soluble uh, components to them that have the potential for discharge in, into the stormwater system. Concrete washout, again, this is always an issue. This is a particularly bad case. Obviously, this concrete washout is well beyond capacity. Um, construction waste is always an issue, but loose materials, trash, debris on the site. Uh, perimeter controls were a big issue as well. Uh, then there was actually documentation of sediment and debris uh, discharging to the Santa Ana River Reach 2 and, uh, and the recharge basins. So um, the ACL considers culpability, cooperation history, the environmental threat, and ability to pay and cost savings from the regional board. So ultimately the, the county was fined $40,000. So. This is a big issue. Um, I didn't have time to present. Uh, there was also an ACL recently in um, San Diego County for a construction site. Um, they had multiple violations. Uh, the city worked closely with the regional board. They were issued a fine of $840,000. So these, these are significant issues. I mentioned before the, the culpability of you as inspect, inspection construct, uh, inspectors. You have to document all the violations that you're seeing escalate enforcement. Otherwise, if the regional board uh, doesn't see that for a site, they may issue your jurisdiction an ACL as well as the construction site. So with that, any last questions, comments? All right, we got you out of here right on time. Thank you.